Tomas, hey, right. congr Tomas, congratulations for singing me a song. Thanks. <laughs> so, so tell me, um, when did it come to the decision that you wanted to make like a follow-up film to uh, Happiness? So um, I always say that uh, Sing Me a Song, in my mind, is not a follow-up, uh, but is the original idea I couldn't do with Happiness because, uh, so I always say that Happiness is a prequel and that the main film is Sing Me a Song. When I started Happiness 10 years ago, really the idea was always to follow the impact of the arrival of these mobile phones in this community. Uh, but because of huge rains, uh, which destroyed the road and delayed the arrival of this electricity and the arrival of these screens, which were first TV and then mobile phones. Uh, I couldn't do the film I, I was supposed to do at the time. So instead I did the, the waiting for this uh, uh, technology to arrive and the film ends with all the villages opening the TV and for the very first time watching uh, American wrestling. Uh, but this is a title, uh, closing title. So, uh, my ID could not been done at the time. So uh, I knew at one stage I would go back. And then uh, I worked on a few other things. And uh, one morning I re woke up like that and said, maybe now it's the time to go back and see what's going on in, uh, in Bhutan. So what was the original idea that you did want to, to do? Um, obviously, Sing Me a Song is that is that movie, but what was the original idea that you wanted to do? So, so the original idea was, was to find uh, a community somewhere in the world, which was uh, entirely disconnected from uh, uh, this technology, uh, internet, mobile phones, TV, and, and follow them through a few years and see in which way this would impact uh, this community. And, uh, and there are not that many places where you can do that. And, um, and so this is why I picked up uh, Bhutan. And this is why after picking up Bhutan, I picked up this village. And when I, 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 when I arrived in this village, which was one of the last one not to be connected with electricity and not being able to watch any of this TV, which only arrived a few years before in Bhutan. And it's only 1998 that the first TV and uh, internet arrived in Bhutan. Uh, and in this village, I picked up Pionki because uh, he was one of the few villagers who had never, ever left the village. Never. He had never seen a car in his life. He had never seen a, a, a city or anything. So uh, I, I was interested in being there where he would encounter all these new things from the Western world arriving in his, in his life. So you encountered Pionki again because he was in your first in your first film how did you manage to convince yeah. him to be in the second film again well very easily and it was uh we've we had always been in in contact and he he i think he he, he liked the process of being part of a, a film and he is himself now very into uh much into films and he is watching a lot of films and he's even spending a little bit of his time directing the other monks in the monasteries these days. So I think the whole concept of the process of a film is something uh, I think he's always, since he's first seen some images, he's always been kind of fascinated by. So uh, uh, it was not very difficult for me to convince him at all. He was very much um, into it. This village in Bhutan, um, because the first time you went there, you basically... I don't want to say you brought technology, but you brought cameras, which probably opened some curiosities. Are they basically used to you the second time around? Yeah, I would say that, uh, um, yeah, I would say that uh, I was really part of, uh, of the whole uh, community and, and it was very easy for me to, to, to hang around them and, and be totally forgotten. This, allowed me to be in this kind of very intimate moments of singing a song, including the one where he's meeting his girlfriend and all that, because I think there is a lot of trust when you're like coming back like uh, 30 times over 10 years to a place. Uh, really, uh, there is a kind of real relationship which is developing in between you and your characters and not only your character, there's the whole community. Um, and uh, and this allow you to, to, to be 
to be there at any moment uh, and not being like an intruder. I'm actually surprised. Do uh, are temples and religious monks actually very open uh, to uh, to documentaries like this? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm not sure they're going to be. I mean, uh, I think. How can I say? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure they're really. And, and which is not my case too. You know, when I started the film, I didn't have a kind of specific idea in my head of demonstrating something. Uh, it happened that Pionki was in the monastery, but uh, what was interesting for me is to follow a young boy during a period of time uh, and, and follow what kind of impact this technology has on its life. But it's not a film about Buddhism. It's not a film about this monastery. It's not a film about Bhutan. I think it's a universal story which could be shot almost anywhere in the world with very tiny details. But I think what is going through in terms of like uh, meeting this girlfriend, being disappointed, something which is happening every day in New York, you know, it's happening every day in every city in the world. So I think there is very little specificity uh, that you can find which are only connected to the country. And I think uh, the authorities understood that, that I was not trying to to just uh, 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 point out anything specifically bad about the Bhutan or whatever. It was more a kind of fable, kind of uh, philosophical tale, something uh, uh, allowing anyone in the world to, to, to just uh, confront his own paradigm with two other paradigms. But uh, realizing that finally uh, uh, the, the common things were much more important than uh, the differences. Because you're technically sing, sing me a song is like years in the making. It's not just a few years, but a lot of years. How did yeah. you know the timing of your story? I mean, how did you actually, the narration of the story for young life, life, the, the timing of I, it I did, is perfect. I didn't. I didn't, you know. Uh, and exactly in the same way when I started to do uh, uh, Happiness, uh, I was supposed to do Happiness in... Uh, 18 months, and I ended waiting for the arrival of uh, electricity for three years. Uh, so you have to be super patient, you know, in the same way, I absolutely had absolutely no clue that uh, it would take him some time to go and leave the monastery, to go in the city and all that. Th this is what makes uh, at the same time documentary production very exciting because you never know where you're going so much. Uh, but also kind of very tiring because you need to be very patient and, uh, and, and finding the right uh, partners to follow you up on when you tell them, well, finally, it's going to be another year. I mean, it might be another two years, you know, uh, and this is a kind of uh, uh, years you are speaking and not uh, weeks or months. So um, I, when I start a project, I just know that there is a kind of... Uh, 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 a story which is only like this boy is living in this town. He has never seen a, a, a screen. In a few months, electricity will be arriving and potentially this might create some stories, but I have no clue what kind of story it's going to create. And, uh, and, uh, and this, is, this is what I like in documentaries. It's like if you're patient enough, I, I always say that I think uh, the... the, the the narrative uh, potential of documentaries uh, can compete with, I think, any fiction. As for the girlfriend side, you actually had to basically, what, have a second crew? I mean, um, was it easy to convince the other side to uh, be part of this documentary? Yeah, well, I didn't have any second crew. I did it myself, but we were shooting. No, we are not shooting at the same time. When I was in town, I was not in the... Uh, I only had one camera and uh, we're, we, we, we recreated some kind of conversation which could be made of two conversations in the edit, but I was never shooting uh, simultaneously at all. So I could spend one week in town and another week in the monastery, which was a kind of one uh, day drive to, to in between the two locations. Um, but, uh, um, but, but besides that, in terms of convincing her to be part of the project was very easy. I mean, everybody is like, as you can see in the film, they're like, they're like very open to any kind of uh, 
they're like very easy people absolutely not afraid of like anything or even of what kind of uh, 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 image they could give of themselves and they're like uh, and, and they're both of them very happy of the film and uh, very satisfied with which with what it says so um, I think they were like I've been very honest about uh, what I was doing and just let the things uh, happen uh, and um, and when you when you do that and when you show the previous work you've done I think uh, you can work worldwide you know uh, I've always been working in very distant and potentially exotic place on the paper realizing uh, after shooting in Papua New Guinea after shooting in Namibia after shooting all over the world that uh, I mean there is very little difference in between the kind of relationship and difficulties to convince someone to do this or that it's the same than in New York or in Paris or anywhere. How did you figure out the um, the narration um, with with her? Because that that storyline was actually fascinating. Did did you? Uh, I want to say was if if you actually predicted where it was actually going, it was it hard to be like a fly on the wall? No, I didn't predict anything. Uh, I knew that at one stage, uh, Pionki would leave uh, the monastery because he always tell me, "I want to leave. I want to leave. I want to go and see the city." I didn't know when I started the film that he would leave to see a girl. This happened while I was shooting and I was seeing him regularly speaking with the same girl on one of these WeChat group where they have like uh, groups where they're sharing songs, another groups where they're like telling ghost stories, another group where they're like uh, speaking among monks, uh, uh, complaining about how they're treated in this monastery and then in this monastery. And, and but regularly among all this group, he was spending a lot of time. There was this girl coming back and coming back. And this is where I said, well, it seems you have a kind of special relationship with her. And, and, and do you mind if I go and speak with her? And potentially, if ever you go and meet her, that I'm going to be following this uh, uh, in advance. And you say, yes, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to go. But if you want, you can do it, you know. But uh, uh, again, th 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 this was this happened but this might not have happened you know and 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 the the first time they meet and the way he's reacting to 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 this meeting it's also something uh, i absolutely had no idea this would happen you know and um and, and i think people think that he's sad because of this reason and this reason i think he's really sad because of uh, of the way she's speaking to him she's very mean and tough with him you know and this is also something I, I could never predict. And this is, again, you know, I, I absolutely have not the slightest clue of where the film is going to hand, what kind of story is going gonna, is gonna to tell. I have a kind of basic frame of someone who, because of who he is and where he is, and I know that they're going to be first times like in uh, happiness you know i was there on the first time where he, he went into a car which was like a three minutes long shot and i could have lasted uh 10 minutes it was magical he was like totally insane yeah he, uh, he was like looking at everything he was so happy to be in this car that i knew when i picked him up 10 years ago that at one stage he would go through that and it could create something visually and in terms of narration, which could be interesting. And then everything else, all the details and all the, the, the they just happen because of this uh, casting. You just have to be very picky and spend a lot of time on who you're going to decide to follow. Because this is going to decide, this is going to really create potentially a film on nothing. And this is uh, uh, why sometimes I can spend three, four, five years in between my films before picking up the right story and the right character for my new project. Absolutely. So how, how did you know when to end this? Because you could have gone forever on something like this. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I even thought at one stage to go to, to, to Kuwait and to follow on, uh, on Ugen's life in Kuwait. You know, she spent a bit more than two years there working in a, 
in a Starbucks, uh, which I find fascinating. And I think it could even have created a, a single film of its own, you know, uh, to follow this group of young girls who had never left the countryside, just arriving in the city, spending a few years in the city and then going abroad in, in, in these countries to, to, to work in these big malls uh, as waiters. This is very, very, very special. Uh, but um, but it's really at the editing room that at one stage you are like working on different kind of tracks. And then at one stage you say, okay, well, we can stop there. You know, maybe there is no need to, 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 to keep on filming, you know, especially when you've been filming for much longer than what you were supposed to. <laughs> so at one stage you, you need to deliver and you need to, 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 to be kind with the, the, the producers and the funders who have been very patient allowing you to take uh, twice of the time you were supposed to to deliver them a film. Excellent. Well, let me wrap it up with one more, more, one more question with you, Tomas. When people watch this film, what is the one most important thing you hope they learn? Alors, learning is not the right term for me when, from what I could expect people to do watching one of my films. I always hope that potentially it can create a little bit of questioning uh, on, on one issue. Uh, and this is the beginning of some thinking that could start on a subject. And if this film can help creating discussions which is what we are trying to do now with the French release in cinemas and in schools and in uh, and universities to have people speaking about their relationship with their uh, mobile phones, because I think mobile phones is the key issue. <laughs> uh, I'm happy because this is what I try to do. It's just by going as far as possible and, and, and just uh, uh, observing us through the impact of something we have created uh, in, in, a, in a community and in a country which didn't know any of that only a few years ago, uh, but potentially re-challenging and rethinking our own relationship with this object. Excellent. Well, hey, Tomas, hey, thank you very much uh, for making um, this documentary, Sing Me a Song. It was very beautiful. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye now.